Hi, I'm Brittany and this is Board Game Coffee and today we're going to be talking to Travis Chance about his new board game that's just been announced, Dark Providence. That's right. So, hey guys. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> it's going all right. So, Travis, mm -hmm. um, sorry I was a little late to the party. What, um, what do you do? Who are you? Tell the people. So I'm a, one of the senior designers over at CMON. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been working in games for quite some time. I owned, a, owned and operated a company called Action Phase Games. Uh, probably the most notable things from that are Aeon's End. I worked at Indie Boards and Cards. I, I was uh, at Colossal Games, Western Legends. Mm -hmm. And so I've been at CMON for a few years now. And uh, this is the first uh, game of mine that's coming that's coming out. Uh, and I'm super excited, super stoked to be able to talk about it with you guys. This is the first time I've been able to talk about it with anyone other than the internally in the company. So this is uh, really cool. Well, you announced it yesterday. That's right. Right, right. And uh, the internet was a buzz. Right. Just, there was a question mark on a on a blanket. It yeah, was, and then you revealed the blanket. It was magical. You it should was have seen magical. it. Uh, like we got Lucas Arts in here. Right. Uh, it was great. That question mark wasn't even there. All it was hard. Screen. It was really hard to talk with all the applause. Like it was kind of de like a deafening. Yeah, yeah. Like bison running in an yeah, open yeah. field. Yeah, we, yeah. We've uh, we've used <laughs> some of our technology to just kind of tone that down. So if you don't hear all like as much applause as he's describing, right, it's right. We, it was just too much. It we had to, well, much. security is keeping them at yeah, that yeah. area. Right. So, um, Dark Providence, what kind of game is it? So, Dark Providence is actually a game that has existed in two other uh, iterations. It was originally a game uh, called A Study in Emerald from Martin Wallace. It's based off of a Neil Gaiman story that is effectively like H.P. Lovecraft meets Sherlock Holmes, right? Uh, there was a second edition, and he, Mark uh, Martin did that, uh, his own label, um, Tree Frog Games, probably like 2014, 2015, something like that, a very long time ago. Super innovative game. It just, like, the first I remember I, I picked it up, and it just blew my mind. Gray, <clears throat> Gray Fox Games did a second edition where they tried to kind of, the game, uh, the original game is wild. I mean, it's just crazy and complicated and, like, just all kinds of really neat interactions. And uh, the second edition was an attempt to try to make it a little more, palatable, like a little more accessible. So it was, in my opinion, a very different game. And I think Gray Fox did an amazing job with what they were trying to do. This third edition, if you will, which is a new edition, is is leans more into the original game, a study in Emerald, the, the Tree Frog Games version, which is we want to go crazy. Like we want the, the crazy, memorable parts of the game. We want to amplify that. We want to bring that up. And we also wanted to make some kind of adjustments to some things like there were some kind of issues at certain player counts there's like a hidden identity type element to the game that it felt like at certain player counts it didn't quite work as well so we even have a solo version in this game which is pretty wild because this this game uh before in its other incarnations it was very reliant on player count mm -hmm. i felt like it played better at a higher player count this game plays great at all player counts all right. So now, for those of us who have never played a study in Emerald, what kind of game? Like, what kind of mechanics can we expect? Like, what kind of game is it? We're just going to like. Let's talk. Talk to me like I'm a three year old. Okay. So um, clean up after. No. Uh, so <laughs> so what, what we uh, the original game? Uh, if you, uh, I'm a huge Martin Wallace fan, and it's like an absolute honor to have my name on a box with his it's like mind-blowing to me um he did a game called a few acres of snow and it was a it was a deck building game that had a board and now mm -hmm. we, we hear people talking about some games that came out in the last few years like these are oh these are the first games that were deck builders with boards not true barton was doing this almost a decade ago so this was the next installment uh, mm -hmm. after that so it is a deck building game um that is u.s cities right mm -hmm. um in the original game it was like cities all over the world and the cards have no costs on them. So everyone starts with the same 10 cards. We are The idea is we are agents that are either working with the old ones mm -hmm. or against the old ones. We're, in this version, we are investigators or we are cultists, and we've introduced a new role called a dissident. Um, what's cool is you have these cards in your hand with little icons on them, right? And the icons will, you basically just play the card and you say, I'll pick one type of icon. I'll play any number of cards with similar, oh, look at that, a whole bunch of cards. <laughs> so um, I'll play, you know, Wyatt Earp and I'll play this card, I'm say I'm Agent Monday, and this card, and I'll just play cubes. 
So cubes would let me take one of the actions that is relevant to cubes, like placing influence. When you're turn, you put them on cards, you can put them on cities to take control of cities, or there are these larger cards called mythos cards, which are like high impact, powerful, super, you know, important uh, things that sit outside of your deck. And when your turn rolls back around, if you have the most cubes on a card, you can claim it with one of your two actions. Mm -hmm. So what's cool is all the cards are crazy good, but there's no cost. The players set the value. So I might go, you know what? I'm going to, I'll bid two on, uh, you know, Carl Young. <laughs> Carl Young. I'll bid two on Carl Young. No one's ever said that in the history of mankind. Um, and then you go, you know what? Actually, I think that card looks pretty good. I'm going to put three on there. Okay. And then my turn rolls around. I'm like, well, dang it, I can't take it. So I'll put some more on there. And then Brittany's like, you know what, actually, I think that card looks pretty good too. Or maybe Brittany is, is a jerk and she plays a card that puts a ward on it and the ward, we, no one can take the card. That's now. more likely. Right. So now we've just, we've invested these resources in it. Now we've, we've been momentarily stymied until we get that same exact card from our deck and we undo that. So there is this really dynamic and amazing element of the how card acquisition works in this. You have characters on the board as well. So you start off with your character and it's agents named after mm -hmm. days of the week and Monday through Friday, right? Um, and you're going to recruit characters. In the original game you could recruit like Sherlock Holmes or like William Morris, like like historical people. This does not have, uh, this has some characters that we made up for the world, but it also has people like Carl Jung or, you know, here in my hand I have Harry Houdini. I have Wyatt or Elliot Ness, Wyatt Earp, Arnold Rothstein, uh, Stephanie St. Clair. These were real people, you know, who were alive in this Prohibition era America. Um, and once you get those agents, then you'll start moving them around the board to do things. You're going to seal gates. Every city has a gate. Uh, so you, if you are a invest, if you're an investigator, you want to seal the gates. You want to stop the impending doom coming. If you are a cultist, you want to open the gate, right? And what's I'm, I'm, I know I'm kind of like foaming at the mouth because I'm so excited. So it's good. But it's good. <laughs> you imagine if you were bored, like, okay, then there's the room. Yeah, so, so, so you, at the beginning of the game, like to kind of hike back, we're all going to get dealt um, an identity, like a role, but we don't know. So Brittany might be on my team. We, you might be on the same team with Brittany. We might all be in a three-player game. We might all be on our own team. We don't know. But the rub of this is each of the, the ways – the, the loyalties scores points in different ways. At the end of the game, you, we reveal our identities if they've not already been revealed through other means. And the team, the side that has the lowest scoring player, no one is, everyone is eliminated from that. So it's, it's weird that it's like a team game, but there's only ever one winner. Mm -hmm. So I played with our developer once we were playing a game and I knew he was on, I figured out that he was on my team and he was going to win. So I started intentionally not scoring points knowing that if he tried to trigger the game and I would be the lowest scoring player and he wouldn't win. So then he had to drag me up in order to make it so, and it, and I, I, it bought me the time that I needed yeah. to, to, to play to try to win the game. I didn't win the game. Uh, but it was, a, it was a really funny situation. So yeah, so you're trying to, there's a lot of social dynamic in the game. You're trying to figure out what, what, what people are doing. And you can even just choose. You could be like, I'm an investigator, but you know what? I'm going to go and assassinate a, an investigator, an agent, get him off the board, which seems like something that a cultist would do or a dissident would do. So you're trying to kind of figure out why people are doing things that they're doing. You're, you're getting cards. All the cards are like insanely powerful or memorable. You have agents you're deploying. You're, these are all like cities. Uh, this is, our version is set in the Cthulhu universe. The Death May Die, probably more notable. Um, so we have like the Great Old Ones. Um, we have, you know, it's U.S. cities east of the Mississippi, and Arkham is one of those cities. Mm -hmm. You're trying to take control of them, which also gives you cards. You're trying to take over these powerful characters to help you win the game, and there's all these different ways you can score points. And it's truly, no one, this game was never described as a sandbox game, but as we were playing it, we realize it really is a sandbox game. You can do so much stuff in this. You could you could build up, you know, you could just try to force the track. Uh, one of the ways that the game can end is there's an investigation and a domination track, one for each faction. And if you peg that track, it'll trigger the end of the game. And then everyone on your team will score those points. So once again, there's this, yeah. well, he marks ahead, and now suddenly I'm worried that you're going to beat me because I don't know where, what other points you may or may not have, right? So there's this really just interesting kind of, secretive um, intrigue element to the game on top of like a really strong mechanical underpinning uh, with, with just simple card play. 
really simple card play. Play cards from your hands for the, the text boxes on them. As you can see, they're all very simple text boxes. Or use the cubes to do, I think there's some crazy like 13 actions you can do okay. with those yeah. icons. Yeah. So here's a, so you mentioned the, the, the it's almost like a, a bidding for the purchasing mm -hmm. of cards. Is it, uh, is it, I imagine it kind of like those those auctions where there's a sheet of paper and you just write twenty dollars, and if you were the last one to write twenty dollars, no, that's yours. You no? put cubes on the card. You can oh, yeah. see it. So it's almost more like t uh, Twilight Struggle or something. Okay, so we put the cubes. Okay, mm -hmm. so I've got the most cubes on there. Mm -hmm. uh, when do I when do I pick it up? Is it like when it rolls back to your turn? If any card has the most cubes on it that are yours, you can choose to take it, but you can only ever take one card. Okay, and where do those where do the rest of the cubes go? Trash. The cubes then go to a place called Limbo, and then you have to use cards with cubes to get cards out of Limbo to go back into your supply. So it's not just I spend them, I get them back. Yeah. So there's like a little bit of a lag. So there's like some maintenance. So if I outbid you, I screwed you for your cubes too? No, no, I get all my cubes oh, yeah. back. It's the winner my... goes to Limbo. Gotcha. gotcha. But you okay. can also play things that don't be, like there's cards. So all right, need, cool. So you need to build your deck according to also getting those cubes so that you can balance Right, so them. like if you don't have a lot of cubes, you know, so like this character, uh, Stephanie St. Clair is really good because she has two influence, mm -hmm. she has two wealth. Wealth is how you, you can buy cubes from the supply. There's, there's stuff over in the supply that you can increase your cube limit. And then the cubes themselves you can use to place on things or to pull them back from limbo. Um, and then she also has the ability to assassinate people. Yeah, as, as one does. Now, uh, one thing I definitely want to talk about is the art in this is fantastic. Yes, yeah, so it's um, the, the artist uh, who's most notable for doing uh, the Arkham Horror covers, uh, a lot of the, art, the FFG Arkham stuff. Which is all gorgeous stuff. It's yeah, beautiful. and and he did all of these. He did, but there's I mean it's crazy. Like you've you know we've got the great old ones. There's like Tesla, J. Ed, or uh, William Randolph Hearst for those of you who like uh, media moguls from that era. Uh, we've got you know J. Edgar Hoover. Then we've got like the great old ones. We got people like Haster um, and and many of the cards. Oh, and he looks like the mini from uh, Death May Die. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. We've got you know. Randolph Carter, who is H.P. Lovecraft's kind of his alter ego that he puts in, into his own stories. Henry Armitage, who is a character. So there's all kinds of stuff. I mean, you got Herbert West, the reanimator. Um, and in the original game, there was a, a small amount of these cards. In yeah. this, there's literally, well, uh, there's almost double the amount of cards. Okay. And we turn the knob up on the power level of these things across the board. So again, it's it's wild. Like we, had, There's a card in the game, um, it was originally called... Uh, I think it's zombies, and it's called Deep Ones in this, where it's a card that you have access mm -hmm. to these eight uh, little guys, these Deep One monsters, and if you can get them all out on the board, you'll it's an alternate way to end the game. You're overrunning the country okay. with ha you know fish mutants. Um, there is a card called Revenants, where it used to be, I think it was like Vampire or something, where you're, you turn, you flip your tokens over, yep. and now you're like the unkillable version of yourself, and you'll score more points for the more people that you turn evil, that you corrupt. Um, and there's all these like little mini elements. You know, Cthulhu, who was in the original game, he comes out, he just eats a city on the mm -hmm. board. And he'll eat the people, the non main characters will be eaten too. And then that will be gone. That will no longer be a place that people can go. And when you get these cards, they, they just like sit in front of you as an yeah. ongoing effect. Yeah. So Carl Young here, his thing is he was a, a, there was a card originally and it just increases your madness limit, which I can talk about in a second. But the, what's cool about this one is you can give this to another player. So I could be like, oh, in this game, you can be driven mad. And if you are an investigator, you will die. If you are a dissident, you will die. If you're a cultist, you've been granted a mortal life by the old ones, so you don't die. When your mm -hmm. identity is revealed, people just know what you are. At the end of the game, in this version, you'll score points if your identity is revealed or is unrevealed. So I could be like, I think he's going to kill him, try to drive himself insane to trigger the game because he's ahead. And I'll go, you know what? Why don't you have Carl Jung? Now you need. Instead of three to drive yourself insane, now you need five to drive yourself insane, yeah. right? Or maybe someone's playing cards and they're trying to give other players yeah. insanity and you could be like, nope, I'm going to keep you around for a while. So this this was a simple card in the original game that did a, a very valuable thing, which is increase that limit. But in this one, you can give it to another player. So it's a little more interactive. Uh, one thing I want to know, is there a limit? To, like, can I just have like... You can have as many of these like things Tesla as you... Tesla and Carl <clears throat> Young right. together. And Tesla, when you take him, he makes you do a sanity test. And when you do a sanity test, you'll reach into a little bag and, and you'll pull a token. And there's two types of tokens. Let's see if I can, oh, I nailed it on the first try, but I also, oh, I didn't nail it because I did the equal amount. There's these. If you ever get three of these, you have to reveal your identity. If you are not a, a, a cultist, the game will end at the end of that turn. 
and uh, that player will lose point or will lose scoring opportunities. Mm -hmm. you, but that because you've driven yourself mad, that does not mean that you've lost. It just means it's a way to control the game. And, and then the other ones are just sane. So you're okay. Like nothing right. bad happened. Mm -hmm. So there's there's actually strategies in the game where you try to speed up the game in while you're ahead in order to close it out. I like the idea of having these guys in front of me on my team and having like, um, you know, Tesla and Hoover and Haster just like chilling, like they're my they're my posse. Right. The Waitleys from Stories, uh, from Dunwich Horrors in here. We've got, you know, things like there's Dagon, there's Yoxathoth. Uh, we've got, you know, the Lost City of Relay, I believe it's called. Um, there's even cards like this. You give this to another player and they score minus three points. But anytime they take a sanity test, they get to give it to someone else. Mm -hmm. So as soon as they draw, draw sanity, they're like, no, actually, you know what? I think you're ahead. Why don't you lose three points? So it becomes this hot potato that you're, you're handing around. This version, I think, it has cards from the original, absolutely, because many of the cards were, were great. Um, but this version, I think, is, has... It takes a lot of those ideas and it pushes them, you know, forward in a way that's really cool. White Earp can close gate. Normally, when a an agent closes a gate, they have to do a sanity test. White Earp, he's he who was alive at the time and in his 80s is such a such a tough dude that he, he's he's unfazed by seeing this. He closes a gate, no sanity test. I'm completely fine. So he's like the ultimate Ghostbuster. He also is very good at stopping the domination from mm -hmm. happening. He drives the track down. One of the only effects in the game that drives it down. It's like, well. So, uh, for, so when this is finally released and I go mm -hmm. to play it, what's what do you, what's the recommended player count? Oh my gosh! I, so I think the more the merrier with this, but I do. I, the, the game becomes extremely strategic at two. Like um, when I was playing this with Chris Ham, uh, the the lead de developer on this, we played this at two, and it became this really interesting dynamic of how do we position while moving ourselves ahead and stopping. So it became a, a game of how can I take something from you that pushes me ahead and denies you of a thing that you need. In the higher player count games, you can hide a little bit. There's a little more social element. The solo game is its own complete, complete own thing. There are like three cultists that you're trying to stop. You are like running around the, the map trying to make sure they don't take over too many things. It's its own complete own little mini game, which Chris designed. He's extremely amazing at design and it utilizes all of the, the mechanisms from the core game. Um, I, I would say I really like it at, at max. I think five is great because you have more opportunity with the uh, the different identities and whatnot to come out, the, the loyalties rather. Um, but I think it plays well at all player counts, which is, you know, uh, not a complaint about uh, Study in Emerald, but as Martin said, the, the two player in it was particularly, it did, it did not capture this very well because mm. the moment if we were on the same team, it didn't it kind of didn't work or if we were on opposing teams it kind of didn't work so we we've, we've added some things in like for example scoring points for your identity being uh unrevealed the dissidents are an, an, a new addition to the loyalties where they get to play both sides but they don't get to score all the 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 two sides score points in different ways and they have some kind of like venn diagram overlap these guys if they ever get revealed they not only do they not score points they lose points so they run around kind of seeming like, what the hell is he doing? He's like, he just closed the gate, then he killed a good guy, then he ran over and he protected another gate. He's a weirdo. Um, but then you're you know, you like, all right, let's do something to him to force him to reveal his identity, and now he's lost some points. And you also know that he's uh, prone to being killed as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's I, it's really like, a, I mean, it, it, it genuinely is one of my favorite games. I'd say top three of all time. Uh, it's been an absolute honor to work on this i think martin is a, a mad scientist he's just a brilliant brilliant designer and i i it means a lot to me that he trusted me to take this i mean i think very innovative game and do something with it uh to try to address some things that maybe could have been done 10 years before or nine years before and also to to add to the to the world and to, to port it over into our own ip you know so how close did you work with martin on this like was it it's just his, like his original design you just kind of took it over most of them sent him a few messages here and there like how tight so so i've worked with martin on games uh at a few companies before okay. I've, I've worked with him uh you know uh we've been in he's a person i check in with he checks mm -hmm. in with me every once in a while so um i knew i heard that the game was available uh so I got a hold of him and we kind of put it through our internal departments and everyone loved it. And from there I put together like a brief 
Martin and I kind of talked about some things uh, with a developer also with Chris and we tried to figure out like how we wanted to approach this and then Martin you know trusted me to go in and make things and then just kind of back and forth like making sure that it is the way that it needed to be high level of trust on his part um, I would like to think I know the original game pretty well as someone who's pretty obsessed with it so I, I, I felt like he you know uh, extended that and also he's just, he's just been making games since like the 80s so like he's mm -hmm. just he's a legend I mean he's just a total legend well this looks apps like it looks fantastic the idea like I can't wait to play it yeah. and the thing is like I personally I've I've only heard good things about studying emeralds so I, it was on my list of, right. like, I gotta play gotta get to this but I just never did and now that I hear this on I'm probably not going to I'm just gonna wait for this right. and, just, and just do this I'm very much like I'm just gonna go for the new version and that's so that's what I'm gonna do. The old version is super expensive. So, <laughs> like, like oh, is it? oh yeah, it's like a Grail game. Uh, it, it, it's it, you see it on eBay, eBay re routinely going for way more than what it originally cost. And uh, you know this has got like beautiful artwork. It's it's got some updated mechanisms. Um, yeah, and it'll be. You no, know, it sounds fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 I, I mean, it's. I, I can't wait to get a copy of it. So <laughs> I'm stoked. Um, I'm, I'm excited. Super stoked. I mean. Deck builders are one of my favorite genres of games to play, and then just the art on this alone with the theme, I can't wait to get this to the table. And for the people watching this, like there's a board, yeah. and like we didn't have a full prototype. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to kind of show off some of the cards mm -hmm. and the artwork for this. We're, we're still, you know, tidying up some loose ends, and uh, it'll, it'll be out here for people to take a look at and and uh, put in their collections. Oh, great. Well, you're gonna if you want to hear more, you're gonna have to stay tuned to uh, all things Simon, and uh, they'll keep you up to date on when this puppy's gonna be released right, and right. where you can get your hands on it, and uh, and then when they can send me my copy because oh, you right. deserve one for this. Uh, this absolutely, this is, this is great. We should play it together. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yes. Absolutely. Can we play this one? We can't play this one because I don't have all the components. To play. Oh. Well, that's this interview was gonna end on a high note. <laughs> That's it. For... It's really it's really hard to make an entire <laughs> competent version of a game like, you know, this was we just wanted to let the we wanted to let people know about it and we had some cards made so that people could take a look and get a gander at the artwork and some of the, you know, the fact that like Tesla's in the game. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, amazing. Yeah. Like Carl Jung has deserved to be in a board game forever. I think he only did what he did knowing that he would eventually be in this board it's... game. <laughs> that was his all of this other stuff this like massive contributions to mental health and and the the you know reflections of what it means to be a human being was really just in pursuit of being on this card right I've always, this I've right. always yeah. said that uh, once Carl Jung appears in a board game then I'm, I'm done I'm cutting right. it out that's it. End a board game card. Yeah. Yeah. retired yeah. so this might be our last episode <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well congratulations thank this you. is so yeah. exciting thank you it's very exciting and thank you for coming on the show and for doing this thing and talking with us and letting us know Thank about uh, Dark Providence and uh, so here it is. People get a get a good look at it. Get behold. a look at behold right behold. here. Look at this. <laughs> all right, that is all. See you guys next week. Thanks for joining us uh, here at Simon uh, Game Expo 2023. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us. If you like this video and you want to see more, subscribe to our channel. It's the best way to keep up to date with everything we do here at Board Game Coffee. But if you want to see more right now, we got plenty of videos to choose from. And if that's not enough, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I'm Mark Maya, and this is Board Game Coffee. And remember, have fun, keep gaming, be social. See you next week.